Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Good. Okay. Okay, so now for something completely different. Uh, what we're looking at here is an image taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. And this part of the sky was selected because it was particularly empty. Nothing there, no stars, no apparent galaxies. And then with the Hubble Space Telescope, this was observed for uh, the equivalent of 12 days, okay, gathering photons. And at the end of that, you see an image like this. And if we could see this image at full resolution, there would be roughly 10,000 galaxies here. So 10,000 galaxies imaging a patch of the sky that's equal to about one ten millionth of the entire sky, okay? So there are billions of galaxies in the visible universe that in principle we can image. This talk is mostly not going to be about the galaxies themselves. Instead, it's going to be about the space between the galaxies. So a lot of this is about space. And what is space and what is space doing? And this is intimately tied to the subject, which is what is the dark energy in the universe? So it'll take a little while before you see where this terminology dark energy comes in, but we're going to start off with space. So, um, let's see. so when Einstein developed the theory of general relativity about a century ago, one of the things that the mathematics of general relativity told him almost immediately was that something that would happen very naturally in general relativity is that space itself would either expand or contract rather than being static. And we're going to talk more about what do we mean when you say space expands or contracts. But when people looked out at the universe, the universe looked static. It looked like things, you know, space was not expanding. And so he tried to fix up his theory by injecting into it, actually a very simple term, we call it the cosmological constant, Einstein's cosmological constant, and by putting that thing in the mathematics, he could make the universe static. And so he thought, great, everything's fixed up. But then about a, about a dozen years later, Hubble established that it looked like space itself was expanding. And I'll tell you what that evidence was uh, soon. Um, and so Einstein realized that that fudge factor he had put in was not necessary. And so he took it out. It was rather ad hoc that he had put it in anyway. So he took it out, and what we're going to do is take Einstein's cosmological constant and put it on the shelf over here, and remember that it's here, because it's going to come back in the story later, okay? So a century ago, or a century ago, it's gone. So, um, so with that context then, let's talk about what expanding space means. So let me show you um, a little animation here. Um, let's see, okay. So in this animation, we have a set of spheres. They're separated by some distance as indicated by the rulers. And the space between the spheres is now going to expand. But as that happens, notice that the size of the spheres does not increase, they stay the same size. And the size of the rulers that are used to measure the space does not increase. So here's the expanding space. The spheres are not expanding, the rulers are not expanding. So in our universe, this would be analogous to the spheres would be like the galaxies. They are not expanding, it's just the space between the galaxies is expanding. And our rulers are not expanding, but the space between rulers or the galaxies is expanding. So to demonstrate this more and to lead you through some of the um, observations that I'm going to uh, share with you, uh, we're going to use a very simple analogy that I think uh, I find that everybody can um, uh, visualize this analogy. Imagine that you have some expanding bread dough. So this is a yeast dough that is going to expand. And embedded in the dough are raisins, okay? And suppose that this dough is expanding at a rate so that it doubles in every dimension in one hour, okay? So one hour, doubling in every dimension. Now imagine that we have a raisin that is, say, one inch from me. So I'm one of the raisins, okay? So there's a raisin one inch from me, and if in one hour the dough doubles, how far is the raisin from me after one hour? That's a question to you. It was one inch, where is it now? Two inches away. How far did it move? One inch, because it went from one inch to two inches, so it moved one inch in one hour. So the average speed that that raisin is moving away from me is one inch per hour, okay? Now imagine that instead we have a raisin two inches away from me. In one hour, where is it? 
It's doubled, so it's four inches, as he said. Four, okay, four inches away. So how far did it move? Two inches in one hour. So what was its speed? Two inches per hour. And so every raisin that I look out, and all these raisins around me in the bread dough, and I see these raisins moving away from me, but their speed, the speed at which they're moving away from me, is proportional to how far away they are from me, okay? So I think I'm a very special raisin because all the raisins are moving away from me. But if you imagine another raisin in the bread dough looking around, that raisin sees the same thing. All the raisins are moving away from it. So in an expanding bread dough or in an expanding universe, at every point in that universe, it appears that everything is moving away from that point. And the speed at which it's moving away is proportional to how far everything is away from the point. So I'm going to show you a graph because I will want to show you some actual data okay, about the expansion of space. So we're first going to look at that graph with raisins, okay? So <laughs> what's on the graph is, so this is the distance to the raisin, and there's the apparent speed of the raisin. So in the first example, I said that if it was one inch away, it's moving at one inch per hour. So then we said, how about one that starts off two inches away, it's going to move at double the speed, and one that's three inches away would be uh, further, etc. Okay? So it's lying on a line. So when you make a graph like this, you get everything on a line, it means you're in an expanding bread dough or expanding space. Okay. So what we want to do then is, uh, first I want to explain to you how Hubble established that uh, we were living in an expanding universe. So instead of raisins, we want to detect galaxies. So how do we detect galaxies? We detect them by the light that comes to us from the galaxy. So um, if we've got a galaxy off here, we're going to detect the light with a fine optical instrument like your eyeball, okay, it could be a telescope. But, uh, and a ray of light is going to leave that galaxy, it's going to enter our eye, and we detect it there. And we trace it backwards and say that's where the galaxy was. Now, light. Okay, light and um, its characteristics are very important for understanding how we know about the expanding universe. So light itself, you know that if you put light through a prism, it'll spread out into a spectrum of colors. And so if you have blue on one end and red at the other end, the difference between blue light and red light is that the well, light itself is an electromagnetic wave. Okay, so there's a wave property. And um, so it has a wavelength associated with it. And uh, blue light has a shorter wavelength than red light, okay? So can you, can you remember that? Blue, squished up waves, red, stretched out, okay? So I'm going to use uh, a prop for that. And unfortunately, I've got this microphone, but I think I can still do this. So imagine that the, look at a slinky like this, where the distance between the coils is like the wavelength, okay? So this would be like blue light. Red light has about twice the wavelength, so I would stretch the slinky to twice the distance. Okay? So, uh, oh, did I say that backwards? No? no? Okay, good. So um, blue light, red light. Okay? So um, let's go back to our galaxy then, which we're going to observe here. And now let's take into account the fact that if space itself is expanding, then the space between the observer and the galaxy is increasing. So now, um, if we're going to see what happens when light leaves the galaxy, the light left the galaxy, but the galaxy is moving away from us, but not through space, right? Is the galaxy moving through space? No, just like, go back to your raisins in the dough. When the dough is rising and I see those raisins moving away from me, is it because the raisins are moving through the dough? No. Just the dough itself is expanding, and it's apparently moving away from me, but not through the dough. Okay? So in this case, too, the galaxy is moving away from us, not through space. It's actually fixed in space, possibly, but space itself is expanding. So then the question is, what happens to the light on the way? So when the light left the galaxy, if it started off as blue light, as it's traveling, space itself is expanding, and so the wavelength of the light is increasing, so it's shifting from blue to red. red. We say it is red shifted, okay? So that's the cosmological red shift of light, that every photon, by the time it gets to us, has a longer wavelength than when it left its source because space itself is expanding, okay? So we can use the measured wavelength because we look for light that, has, that, that we know, and I won't get into the details, 
But we know what it, its wavelength was at its source, um, and so we can measure the wavelength that we actually measure, and that tells us something about how much space has expanded and the recession, the apparent recession velocity or speed at which the galaxy is moving away from us. Okay. So that's going to allow us to measure the equivalent of the speed of the rays that's moving away from us. Okay? But now we have to measure the distance to the rays. Because remember I said, if the rays started off one inch away, it's going to inch, one inch per hour. So distances. Distances are very, very difficult to measure in the universe. Um, especially if we want to talk about cosmological distances. So like looking halfway back to the Big Bang, you know, just really far distances. So we need, how can we measure a distance in the universe? So that's one question. Um, and we want to look at things very far away. So one way to do it is, uh, we can't just lay out a tape measure or something, but one thing we can do is if we can identify objects in the universe that have a known brightness, so they all have the same brightness, then look at this. Um, oops, this was my blue light and my red light. Um, okay. Oh, I forgot the, the, the plot. Uh, let's, let's review this because we'll see something like this uh, later. That when Hubble, uh, back uh, around 1929, first established that it, the space itself was expanded, he made a plot, just like a Mason plot, where on this uh, axis, instead of speed, he measured the redshift of various galaxies. And then he measured the distance, and these were fairly nearby galaxies, so the distance could be measured using parallax and various um, methods like that. So uh, that, and he found that it was on a straight line, so the universe was expanding like the bread dough. But the question is, if you look very, very far away, okay, so higher red shifts, bigger distances, what's happening here? Does it stay on this line, okay? Now the prediction, uh, in the, you know, up until the end of the 20th uh, century, was that the expansion of space should be slowing down. And the reason is that um, everything embedded in the space, all these galaxies, are gravitationally attracting each other. Okay, so they're embedded in the space. Space is trying to expand, but the stuff embedded in it is attracting each other. Kind of like with the raisins embedded in the dough. Imagine if the raisins don't want to get away from the other raisins. They're all kind of embedded, and they're embedded in the dough. They're going to produce some drag and stop it from uh, expanding as fast. So the question was, how fast is the expansion of the universe slowing down? That's what people were trying to measure at the end of the 20th century. So we needed to measure things that were very, very far away, so very, very high redshift. So you need something very bright. And if you can have something that has a known luminosity, then you can use it as what we call a standard candle, like this. Suppose you have a whole sequence of candles, and they all have exactly the same brightness. You can tell how far away they are by how dim they are, or bright. Okay, so the dimmer they are, the further they are away. So the question is, is there anything out there in the universe that's very bright and that can be used as a standard candle? And I recognize some people in the audience from previous talks I've got made, uh, given. So the answer is yes, and the object is a? Type 1A supernova. Yeah, type 1A. Oh, our first speaker knew what it was. A type 1A supernova. So a supernova is an exploding star. A type 1A supernova is a very special type of exploding star. And here's an artist's rendition of this. This is not a real picture. But, um, and it's a binary system, meaning two stars going around each other. One of them is a big gaseous star like this, OK? And the other one is a white dwarf, which means a dead star. It's no longer burning uh, with, through fusion. But uh, because of gravity, mass is accreting off this one onto this one. So this one is growing, grabbing more and more mass from this one. When this reaches a very specific mass of about 1.4 times the mass of our sun, okay, it um, can no longer uh, sustain the pressure, uh, sustain its size because of the gravitational pull, and it basically becomes very, very dense, so dense that it reaches the critical density for fusion, and it becomes a giant bomb, a thermonuclear bomb. Okay, so it's like a fusion bomb, but the mass of it is 1.4 times the mass of the sun, so it is incredibly bright. It outshines its entire host galaxy once it explodes. 
And so it's extremely bright, and it turns out it's a standard candle because they always explode at the same mass, okay, to a good approximation. So these type 1a supernovas, so for example, here's a picture of a galaxy, and that is the type 1a supernova right there. And you might say, well, that doesn't look so bright. It, uh, the uh, detector here is probably saturated, okay, uh, because it's um, so bright. So um, there it is. So here are three things that show a supernova. So first look at the one on the left. The supernova is um, actually decaying away here. There it goes, okay, so that was the supernova going off in this galaxy. This is the brightness as a function of time. It takes about two weeks to get to the brightest point and then a couple of months to decay away. So you have to watch many, many galaxies, actually, to see one of these go off. And then the other thing you do is look at the spectrum of light coming off as a function of time here because a type 1a spectrum will have a very specific feature. So you know you've got a type 1a that's a standard candle. So in the uh, 1990s, uh, two different groups simultaneously in competition uh, were um, looking at these supernova and each got uh, a few dozen of them and managed to um, measure the brightness and the redshift and it's like measuring for the races, the distance and the speed to establish what was happening to the expansion of the universe. And so, first of all, by 1996, um, one group had measured uh, out to you know fairly high redshifts, and everything was lying on a straight line. And then, people managed to get these two groups to get uh, galaxies um, with a uh, supernova with redshifts uh, that are higher here, and their data look like this. So look at the yellow line. Okay, the yellow line was the expectation. And instead, they found, so each dot here corresponds to a supernova, so each one's on here, and everything is lying to the left of the line. So I'm going to walk you through the logic here. So what they found was that for a given brightness, okay, for given brightness, the redshift was less than expected to the left of the yellow line. Therefore, the universe was expanding, so less redshift, expanding at less than the expected rate in the past, or in other words, the universe is expanding at an ever-increasing rate today. Okay? So rather than the gravitational attraction of these galaxies slowing down the expansion, instead something else has an even greater effect and is causing the expansion of space to increase at an ever-increasing rate. So beforehand, the question was, how fast is the expansion slowing down? When is it going to stop? Will the universe start to contract again? Instead, we find that no, it's just a runaway process okay, of the expansion of space increasing and increasing. So um, the first thing we need to do is put a label on our ignorance as to what this is. Okay? This was totally unexpected. So we call it dark energy. The reason we call it dark energy is that it turns out that in the theory, you can put back in the mathematics something that will have this effect and cause the expansion of space to increase. And what is it? Remember the thing we put on the shelf over here a while ago, right back about a century ago? Einstein's cosmological constant that he had put in to try to make the universe static. Turns out that given the contents of the universe, we can put that back into the theory now and it'll cause the expansion of space to increase, okay? Um, and when you put it in the theory, it has dimensions of energy density. So like there is an energy density in the universe. It's here, in the room, it's everywhere. Um, and how much of the energy in the universe does it make up? Well, if we put it on a pie chart, it's about two thirds of the energy density of the universe is in the form of this dark energy that we just put in now again ad hoc, kind of just like um, Einstein had to. We have no idea why it has the magnitude it does. An incredible number of theorists are working on trying to uh, figure out what it is, why it's there in uh, a mathematically consistent way, and it is one of the most baffling things we know about. So what's the other one third? Uh, it's gravitationally attracting matter. And I might think, oh, well, of course, it's all those galaxies I mentioned at the beginning. And I said there are billions of them in the visible universe, so that's what they are. Well, actually, of all that gravitationally attracting stuff, 
Only 5% is the stuff that makes up galaxies and makes up us, the solar system, all that stuff. The other, about a quarter of the energy density of the universe, is another thing that we label with our ignorance <laughs> and call dark matter. And that's a whole other talk, which I won't get into here. I have a TED talk on that. If you just Google dark matter TED, uh, you'll get that. And in there, I talk about the evidence for dark matter, this gravitationally attracting stuff, which seems to almost have the opposite effect of dark energy, because dark energy causes space to expand, dark matter kind of draws things together. Here, how much time do I have left? Two minutes? Okay. So um, I'll tell you one more thing then, uh, and that is uh, that this dark matter, so here's the plot, which you might recognize as one of the, uh, actually Google put this one together, I think. No, it was NASA. Um, oh, Google Earth at night. Okay, good Google. <laughs> um, so we recognize this as light lighting up where population is clustered in the United States, okay? So the same way galaxies, like the galaxies that I showed you in that picture, they are just little markers marking where the dark matter has clumped, okay? So when we run simulations, and we can run simulations now, I mean, these are massive simulations we run, starting off with the universe just after the Big Bang um, with some uh, fluctuations in overall approximately dense matter, and it'll clump and form this webby structure. So the light stuff is the dark matter, okay? Um, so uh, everything that's light there is a concentration of dark matter. And it, we predict that right now in our universe, the dark matter has this webby structure with voids, and then we have theories and models for how the galaxies adorn that. So here's the galaxies adorning the dark matter, okay? So there's just little markers as to where the dark matter is. Um, and so what we do is we go to the actual universe and map out where all the galaxies are. So for example, in this picture right here, let me put the observer, so see the eyeball there? Okay, looking out into the universe, the color coding is uh, the red shift, so redder stuff is further away from us. And you can't, this just looks kind of like a smear to you, but this is, a, is um, millions of dots, each representing a galaxy and its location, okay? So far away with the highly redshift and stuff over here, you can see this webby structure here. So then what we do, so these are actual galaxies. So we run these simulations with different ingredients in the universe, different amounts of dark matter and dark energy, and predict what the universe should look like. And we can produce simulations that look like this. And it's not that every galaxy here will be an identical place to this one over here, because there's, there's randomness, but the texture is the same. So in cosmology, what we're doing is measuring the texture of the universe. And so basically, we now have models. And you know, when I have that pie chart showing that over 2 thirds is dark energy, you might say, well, what? where do you get that from? It's basically by doing these kinds of matches. You know, how much do you need so that the texture of the universe is the same? So I'm going to stop there because my main point then is that we know now that 95% of the energy density of the universe, or the stuff in the universe, is this dark stuff. And dark is basically, in both cases, means we don't understand what it is. But we have great fun trying to figure out, okay? So there are many experiments doing that, and uh, that's what my research is focused on. Um, and if we have time after the perception stuff, I'd be happy to talk to you about that. Okay, thank you.